In this video, we're going to work on calculating probabilities. When all outcomes in the experiment are equally likely, the probability of an event E is going to be N of E over N of S, where N of E represents the number of outcomes in the event E, and N of S represents the number of outcomes in the sample space, or if you say that differently, the total number of outcomes in the experiment. So this is the main formula that we're going to be using in this video. So let's jump into our first example. A box contains four defective and five good items. Three items are randomly selected from the box. We want to find the probability that no defective items are selected. So first thing we want to do is find n of s. That's the number of elements in the sample space, or if you say that differently, that's the total number of outcomes in the experiment. So at this point, we don't care about defective and good items, and we would just say, well, if there are four defective and five good, that means there are nine items in total. And what we're doing in this experiment is we're choosing three of these items. So let's think about the number of ways to choose three of nine items. There's no mention of order here, so this is an unordered selection. And thinking back to our counting techniques from chapter three, that would be C9, comma three. Now the other number that we need is the number of outcomes in our event. So this is where we think about the specific probability that we're trying to calculate. What we want is for no item, no defective items to be selected. So N of E is the number of ways for no defective items to be selected. So if we're getting no defective items, that means we're choosing three good. And since there are five good items to choose from, again, this is an unordered selection, it's going to be C53. So the probability that no defective items are selected, we're just going to write that as probability of E. The way we calculate that, we go N of E divided by N of S. So that's C5, 3 divided by C9, 3. And remember, you can calculate both these numbers on your calculator. So that's 10 over 84, or we can turn that into a decimal. That's about 0.12, or about 12% probability. Part B, we're going to find the probability that two defective items are selected. So we're still doing the same experiment where we've got these four defective and five good items in a box and we're choosing three of them. Therefore, N of S is still going to be the same. So typically in these multi-part problems, you calculate N of S one time and you use it in all the different parts of the problem. What's going to vary is N of E, which is the number of ways to have a specific event happen. So in part B, now the event that we care about is getting two defective items. So just by default, we'll call whatever event we're interested in, we'll call that E. So N of E now is the number of ways to get two defective items. But remember that we're choosing three items in total. We were told that in the description of the problem. So to say two defective means we're getting two defective and one good and that and is going to prompt us to multiply. So I'm just going to write down some details on the side. In our box, we have five good items and four defective. So you can just draw yourself a little picture like that. And let's think how many ways there are to make this choice. So of the four defective, we're going to choose two. That's an unordered selection. And then we're going to multiply by the number of ways to choose one good. So that's C5, one. So C42 is 6, C51 is 5, so if you compute this part, you're getting 30. Um, and then we can turn that into a probability pretty quickly. We're just going to say probability of our event E is N of E divided by N of S, and we can put all our numbers in here. So we've calculated N of E to be 30. That's the number of ways to get two defective items. We know N of S. From the beginning of the problem in part A, we figured out that was 84. So we're just going 30 divided by 84. And that gives about 0.36. So about 36% probability of that happening. Third and final part for this problem, we're going to find the probability that at least two defective items are selected. So this is now our event E. Just by default, E is whatever specific event you're interested in in each part of the problem. 
and we're going to calculate n of e. So let's figure out logically what the di different decisions would be. If we want at least two defective to be selected, we could have two defective and one good. So I'll just write D for defective, G for good. Or we could have a completely different scenario where we have three defective. And remember that in our box, we have five good parts and four defective parts. So I'll just draw that little picture on the side so that we know what numbers we're working with. Thinking back to chapter three, when we were practicing our different counting techniques, remember that the word and is gonna prompt us to multiply and the word or is gonna prompt us to add. So let's see if we can figure out n of e. Well, we need to choose two defective parts out of four. That's an unordered selection. So we're going C4, 2 times C5, 1. So this number is actually the number we had in part B because we were looking for two defective items. Um, but now we're adding a different case to that. So the word or is gonna prompt us to add. We're now including the situation where we could have three defective items. So a number of ways to get that would be C43. So let's put all these numbers into our calculator. This guy is six, this one's five, and this one's four. So you could just figure out those in steps and say six times five plus four gives us 34. And that's the number of ways for E to happen, number of ways to get at least two defective parts. And to turn that into a probability, we're taking n of e and we're dividing it by the number of outcomes in the sample space. And remember, we calculated this number right at the beginning of the problem in part a. So you typically only calculate this number once. So our probability then is going to be 34 out of 84. You can put that into your calculator and it comes out to about 0 0.40. So about 40% probability of getting at least two defective parts. So new problem, let's say a die is rolled seven times and we want to find the probability of getting exactly five threes. So this is our event E that we're interested in and a couple of things we're going to have to do. We're going to have to calculate number of outcomes in the sample space and we're going to have to calculate the number of outcomes in the event E or the set E. So a good tip for these probability problems is to always try to calculate N of S first. The reason I suggest that is N of S is typically a fairly easy calculation to do. And so if you are feeling overwhelmed with these probability problems, uh, it's always good to try to get something relatively easy out of the way first. And it's typically a good way to get part marks on a problem. Um, even if you aren't sure you can finish the entire problem, you can typically get N of S calculated without too much work. So let's try to get in the habit of doing that first, and then we can get into the specifics of what event E is happening and how many ways are there for that event to happen. So when we say N of S, we're just looking at the experiment as a whole. What we're doing is we're rolling this die seven times and we're asking what is the total number of possible outcomes? That's what N of S is. So we'd say, well, on the first roll, any one of six numbers could come up. So there are six possibilities. On the second roll, another six possibilities. And since we're just rolling this die over and over, uh, the number of possibilities is going to multiply. So we're just going to go blah, 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 multiply by six a bunch of times. And let's call that six to the seven. From there, we get into our specific event E, which is the situation where we get exactly five threes. So N of E is going to count the number of ways to get exactly five threes. Well, let's think about the different choices we're going to have to make. We're going to have to choose which roles are three. Is it going to be, you know, the first five roles? Is it going to be the last five roles? And if we write this down a little bit more specifically to help us with counting, we could say choose five of seven roles to be a three because we're rolling this die seven times and we want five threes to come up. So we're choosing five of the seven roles to be the roles that the three comes out on. So that's one choice we're gonna to have to make and we're gonna to have to do a couple of other things. So once we've chosen which five roles are three, you could imagine we're saying, okay, three here, three here, let's say three there, three there, three there. We still have a couple of questions and that would be, 
what is the first non three and what is the second non three? And once we know those two question marks, then we will have specified the entire sequence of roles. So let's say this choice here is to choose the first non three, whatever that number might be. And then next choice would be to choose the second non three. And once we've made all those choices, then we completely understand what our sequence of roles looks like. So this will be giving us the total number of ways to get exactly five threes. So let's do our counting. If we want to choose five of seven roles, then we're doing an unordered selection. So it's a combination from the seven roles, just choose five of them. Okay, then we need to choose the first non three. So that non three could be one, two, four, five, or six. That means there are five choices for what it could be. It just can't be a three. And similarly, five choices for the second non three. So if we grab our calculator, this number here works out to 21. In other words, we've got 21 times 25. You can check overall that comes out to 525. So here we have our probability coming up then, probability of our event E, we're gonna take N of E, which is 525, and divide it by N of S, which is six to the power seven. And let's just turn that into a decimal. So that comes out to 0 0.002, or if you wanted to express that as a percentage, that's 0.2%. So not a very good chance at all of this happening. Uh, and let's try to just understand intuitively why that would be the case. If you roll a die seven times, you're expecting about one three among those seven rolls, maybe two threes it's pretty unlikely that you're gonna end up with five threes among those seven rolls. And now we know specifically how unlikely. Now let's say a five card poker hand is dealt and we wanna find the probability of getting two pairs. So let's write down an example of what two pairs would look like. So that would mean that you have two cards of the same denomination, say eight and eight, and then you've got another two cards of matching denominations, say queen and queen. And then you've got a fifth card. We know we're talking five card poker hands. And this fifth card should not be an eight or a queen. Because if it were an eight or a queen, you'd actually have a much better hand. It would actually be a full house in that case. So you've got one pair, then you've got a pair of a different denomination, and then you've got a fifth card that doesn't match with any of the previous cards. So that's what a two pair hand looks like. So our goal is to calculate the probability of getting two pairs. Well, we said in our previous problem, always good to think about N of S first. So that's the number of outcomes in the sample space. Or if you say that differently, that's just the total number of outcomes in the experiment. So all we're talking about here is just dealing a five card poker hand. We know from our discussion of cards that there are 52 cards in the deck. So what we're doing here is we're choosing out of 52 cards, choosing five of them to be our poker hand. And let's consider this to be an unordered selection. So we don't really care in which order the cards are dealt. If, if we got queen, eight, eight, king, queen, that would be still considered two pairs. So unordered selection. Now this is a pretty big number. It's about 2.6 million. So I'm just gonna leave it in terms of the combination so that we don't have to write down a huge number. Okay, so if we were doing this on an assignment or on a test, we've already earned some of the part marks there just by figuring that out. And now we're gonna get specific into our actual event. So our event is the situation where we're getting two pairs and we need to calculate the number of ways that that can happen. So let's think about our different choices. So one of the things we're going to have to do is choose the denominations for the pairs. And this is an unordered selection because if you say queen and eight, that's the same thing as saying eight and queen. Either way, you're ending up with a pair of queens and a pair of eights. So that's an unordered selection. And if we want to be specific here, we could say we're choosing two of 13 denominations. So that's just saying, are we getting queens and eights? Are we getting twos and fours? Are we getting jacks and fives? What are our two pairs? So that's one of the things we're gonna to have to do. 
Um, remember that all the cards in the deck have suits with them as well. So when you talk about a pair of queens, there's actually multiple different ways to get a pair of queens. So we're going to need to choose the suits for both of these pairs. Let's say choose suits for the first pair. Then we'll know specifically which cards are forming the first pair. And then similarly, we're going to have to choose the suits for the second pair. So let's think about what we've chosen at this point. If we've chosen two of 13 denominations, then we know we're getting queens and eights, for example. And if we've chosen the suits for the first pair, let's say we've got, okay, queen of hearts, queen of diamonds. Uh, let's say we've chosen the suits for the second pair. Maybe it's clubs. So eight of clubs and eight of diamonds. So we now completely know those cards. Last thing we need to figure out is just what is our fifth card? So let's just say choose the last card and I think that part will be relatively simple. So each of these parts here is joined by an and. This is a sequence of choices that we need to make. So we're going to be multiplying and we'll just figure out how many ways there are to make each of these choices. So if we want to choose two of 13 denominations, that's an unordered selection. Doesn't matter whether we go queen eight or eight queen. So we're using a combination that's C13, 2. To choose the suits for the first pair, well, there are four suits in the deck and we're gonna choose two of them to be the suits for our first pair. Similarly for the second pair, C4, 2. Okay, then it comes down to choosing the last card. And what we know about this last card, let's look up at our description here, is just that it should not be an eight and it should not be a queen. So if we think about how many ways there are to do this, well, there are 52 cards in the deck. We have to eliminate four because we don't want it to look like the first pair. And we have to eliminate four more because we don't want it to look like the second pair. Uh, so there are gonna be 44 choices for what that last card is. And so that includes the denomination and the suit. So we know completely what that last card will be, 44 different ways to choose that. So 13, Choose two is 78, so we got 78 times 6 times 6 times 44. We can put all this stuff into our calculator. Get 123,552, and now we can turn that into a probability. So now to finish the problem, we're going to say probability of E is N of E over N of S. N of E we saw was 123,552. N of S we said was a big number, we just called it C. 52,5. And so you can type this into your calculator, just go 123,552 divided by, and then you can input your bottom number here, and it should come out to about 0 0.05. So about 5% probability of getting two pairs when you're dealt a five card poker hand. So one useful rule for calculating probabilities is called the complement rule, and it says that the probability of E is 1 minus the probability of the complement of E. This can be really useful if E is difficult to calculate directly, or if the event E involves many different cases, then probability of E might be just difficult to work with, and so this gives us an indirect way of finding the probability of E. Okay, let's draw a Venn diagram here and just understand why this should be true. So suppose you just have a single event E that you care about. I'm gonna label this circle as being E. Everything outside the circle is the complement of E. And we know that in a sample space, the total of all the probabilities is one. So probability of E plus probability of E complement must be equal to one. That's just another way of saying probabilities have to add up to 100%. And so if we rearrange this, this says probability of E must be one minus probability of E complement. And that's our complement rule. So let's put a star beside that complement rule and we're gonna do two short examples uh, to practice that. So let's say in a class of 40 students, six have the flu. Five students are randomly selected from the class. Let's find the probability that at least one has the flu so it's implied here that when we say at least one, we're talking at least one of the five selected students. So let's think about our event here. The event that we're actually interested in, we'll call E, 
and that's the event where at least one student has the flu. Now, if we start to break this into cases, that could mean one has the flu or two has the flu, three, four, or five have the flu because we are selecting five students in total. So that seems like a lot of cases to deal with, and this is a perfect situation to use the complement rule. So let's think about E complement. So if we say it's not true that at least one has the flu, then we're saying none have the flu. And that does seem like an easier probability to calculate. So the idea is that we'll calculate the probability of the complement of E, and then we'll use the complement rule to get our answer at the end. So let's calculate the probability of E complement. That's the probability that none have the flu. So to do that, we're gonna think about how many ways to select five students so that none have the flu. Well, what might be helpful here is just to have a picture of our class. We've got 40 students, six have the flu, and 34 are healthy. Okay, so F means flu, H means healthy. So if we wanted to calculate the probability of the complement of E, I would start by thinking about the sample space. Let's do this in steps. So N of S is just the total number of ways to select five students from our class of 40. This is an unordered selection. So it's gonna be C 40 comma five. And then we need the number of ways for E complement to happen. So this is the number of ways to choose five healthy students. E complement is none have the flu or all are healthy. So C 34 comma five, all of those five students would have to be chosen from the 34 healthy students. So from there, we can get our probability of E complement. So we're just going N of E complement divided by N of S, that's C 34 comma five divided by C 40 comma five. And let's just turn that into a decimal. So that's about 0.42. And remember, that's not the probability that we're looking for. We're actually looking for the probability of E. But thanks to the complement rule, we can say, well, probability of E is gonna be one minus the probability of E complement. So that's one minus 0.42 or 0.58. And if we're being picky here, I'm just gonna use approximate symbols here because we rounded off the 0.42. So approximately 0.58 or 58% probability. A group of 20 people are randomly selected. We want to find the probability that at least two of them share a birthday. And a couple of notes about this. We'll assume 365 days in a year. So we're just going to ignore the leap year February 29th possibility. Just for simplicity, we'll ignore that. And we're also going to disregard the year. So we're just talking month and day. We're uh, grabbing these 20 people. So you can imagine you've got 20 selections here. People are just saying their month and day, you know, like Feb, 9, June, 17, etc. So you've got 20 responses like that. So what's the probability that at least two of them are saying the same thing? Maybe two of them are saying June 17th, for example. Already I have a sense that this is going to be hard to calculate directly because if we're talking about at least two sharing a birthday, could be we've got two people on the same day, could be even that we've got rarer situations where three of them are saying the same day or even four or five, etc. And then we have questions about, well, which day is it that's being duplicated? So that's a whole lot of cases. And this is a perfect setup for the complement rule. So event E, which we actually care about, is that at least two share a birthday. Now let's think about E complement. So if it's not true that two of them are landing on the same day, then they must all be landing on different days. They are all giving different answers for what their birthday is. So E complement is something that we should be able to calculate the probability of relatively easily, and then we'll use the complement rule to finish off the problem. So let's start by thinking N of S, and then we'll figure out N of E complement. And from there, we can get our probability. So N of S, you're just thinking about your experiment as a whole, which is we are choosing 20 people, randomly selected, and we're just figuring out what their birthdays are. So 365 options for what the first person's birthday could be, 365 options for the second person, and we're going and we're talking to 20 people. 
So this is going to be a huge number, best way to describe it, 365 to the 20. Okay, now we need to think about the number of ways in which all of these birthdays are different. So for the first person, 365 options, once they've said what their day is, then there are only 364 options for the next person because we want those birthdays to be different. Then 363, then 362, and we're sort of getting tired of writing this out. So there is a better way of describing this and that's with a permutation. So permutation, we're doing an ordered selection from the 365 possible birthdays, we're choosing 20 of them in order. And the reason this has to be an ordered selection is let's just imagine that two of our people are Al and Bob. Remember, we actually have 20 people that are being selected here. Uh, but if Al says his birthday is January 1st and Bob says his is December 31st, that's different than doing it the other way around. So that's different than this outcome here where Al is saying December 31st and Bob is saying January 1st. So that's why we need the ordered selection and that's a permutation that's gonna do that for us. So P365 comma 20, also probably quite a large number. So I'm just gonna leave it as is. So from there, let's figure out the probability of the complement of E. We're gonna take N of complement of E. So P365 comma 20 divide by n of s, 365 to the 20. And you should be able to type this just as is into your calculator to get a decimal. So that comes out to about 0.59. And remember, that's not actually the probability that we're after in this problem. What we want is the probability of e, so the probability that at least two do share a birthday. So to do that, we'll use our complement rule. Probability of e is gonna be one minus the probability of E complement. So we're just saying that's approximately 1 minus 0.59 or about 41%. So that's our video on calculating probabilities. Thanks for watching.